something. And uh, man, what rose up in my spirit strong was the power of an endless life. Say that with me, the power of an endless life. The power of an endless life. That's what the word has to say concerning Jesus. Because he wasn't of the tribe of Levi or a part of the Levitical priesthood, nor of Aaron's uh, Aaronic priesthood. And Aaron himself was of the tribe of Levi. But it says Jesus came according to a different order. And the Bible also says that, therefore, the priesthood changed. Everybody said the priesthood changed. So Jesus comes on the scene to fulfill scripture, of course. And more than just that is happening because it's not just saying he came to fulfill scripture, but he came to change things. Under the old system, God had created, of course, man, mankind in the state of innocence and purity, but man sinned and separation came. And so as man continued to sin, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, I've shared this with you before, and you probably know it by reading as well. By the time we get to Genesis chapter 6, God is repenting for having made man. Because his ways were only wicked continuously. In other words, it became more and more gross. And God says, my spirit will no longer strive with man, for he is indeed flesh, carnal. And it's his ways that are getting more and more wicked. So as time went on, of course, we had the patriarchs come up, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then God makes this solemn promise to Abraham, telling him that he's going to bless him. He's going to multiply him. And his descendants will be innumerable. Then we fast forward to Moses, and Moses comes in as a prophet with the law of God to try and teach the people of God God's ways. There's the way of holiness and righteousness, and then there's the way of evil and wickedness. And God was trying to teach his people because they had become so secular and worldly, and from the time of Genesis 6 moving forward, you would have thought that, well, maybe at some point the people would have turned, but they only got progressively worse. So God brought the law in, and the law was there to let them know how evil sin is in God's eyesight. In our eyesight, you know, for many, it's like it don't matter. It ain't nothing. People doing their own thing. We live in America, and this is just, you know, they do whatever they want to do, free country, and even in other countries as well. So God had to bring in the law to let them know that sin is exceedingly sinful in his eyesight. So to continue to move forward, things didn't get better, but God had made a promise. He had established a covenant with man that only he himself could fulfill. And that covenant that he had established from the beginning up until the time of Jesus coming upon the earth, the people were looking in hope, but they didn't see the manifestation of it. And under God's law and God's rules was in six days he created all creation. And on the seventh day he did what? And so God established a system of rest, and that was the seventh day, known as the Sabbath or Saturday and that, at that time, because Saturday is the seventh day. With the Lord at the beginning, 
it was always the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day, and the seventh day. It wasn't necessarily Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So God established a period of rest, and he established that for the people trying to teach them about what was to come. God established his creation. His creation was given over to wickedness and darkness. And so that system and all had to come to an end. After all, death had entered in through one man, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And death spread to all men because all have sinned. So even in God's creation, it was going to come to an end one day. And there was no hope. Even the law itself, the Bible says this. I'm not making it up. The law is good, but the law is weak because it does not contain the power to deliver. So you had that old system, and everything was going to perish till Jesus came. And he comes with the power of an endless life. And so just like God had his rest at the end of seven days or at the, on the seventh day, he had that creation under the old. Jesus comes in, and my emphasis right now and for the remainder of this evening is on new creation. Everybody say new creation. How many of you in here think I'm old? I'm not going to include Pastor Lucia in that because it's not proper to say that a woman is old. She's beautiful. But if some of you would be honest and I tell you I'm 63 and I'll be 64 in another month or so, you get that age, you start saying, or so, yeah. 64. And, and for some of you, you think, wow, that's old. That's old. I know Sister Yvonne's like, no, it's not old. However, I like every year that I reach in this natural. I rejoice in every year. But it's not even about that anymore. Whether you dread getting older or whether you're excited about getting older. I happen to be in the latter, one who gets excited about getting older. <laughs> Amen. Because some people get messed up and so they start doing their face and tummy tucking and stuff like that and you know because they want to look pretty or try and maintain their youth if you will but the thing of it is is that we are a new creation and just because I've been saved 39 years plus I don't know how many years you may have been saved you're still a new creation you're part of a new creation. Think about this. It's a creation of a new order. God established new order with Jesus. He said you cannot put new wine into old wineskins, which he was really dealing with the heart, the state of the heart and the conditions of the people because they were so fixed on what they had that they did not want to let it go in order to get the new. When it came to John and his disciples, his disciples became jealous because people were flocking to Jesus. Why? What is this new doctrine he had? It's not so much that it was a new doctrine, but it was a new creation that he was speaking of. Saying of how things are going to be. And Jesus comes on the scene and he's talking about a kingdom. They understood what the natural kingdom was. They understood the kingdom as it was under David, 
Israel being the, 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 the land and the territory, David being their king, if you will, the one that God favored and highly exalted and said, because of you, there will always remain a man on the throne. But he comes preaching a kingdom and he comes preaching about a new creation. He doesn't use those terms, but he, call, he talks about the church, the ecclesia. There was an old church under the old covenant, and Jesus started talking about a new church under a new covenant, and it's known as that new creation that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is a, and you are that forever. Because you are that for now, and you are that for the world that is to come. The power of an endless life means that he was of a life that had no beginning. Because all things began in God and came forth. Who created God? Nobody. God created everything. It's hard for the mind to grasp that, but it is the truth. Remember, we're building our lives on truth. Truth is our foundation. Our foundation is the word of the living God. What the word has to say is what goes for us. And so he brings us into this power of an endless life. And one writer or commentator says, it might have not just been one, but maybe many, but it's inserted that he's talking about the resurrection life. Jesus had to die in order to initiate, manifest, give birth to this new life that we now have in him. As I've said before, even when you see the body in the casket, that's not the end and that's just the shell that housed the person. If they believed in Jesus, that was not their destination. They are not in the grave. They are not in the cemetery. They are in glory. Amen. He that believeth in me, though he die, yet shall he live. He that believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this. Jesus brings us into something altogether new, and he also has a rest for us. A rest from all of the pressures, all of the turmoil, all of the things that go on in society, all of the things that would go on in our personal lives, he's given us a rest from it. And that rest is only in him. As God had his rest in the beginning under the old creation, now Jesus comes with a new creation, and that creation is new forever. His closing words, not the, the exact end, but... One of the statements that he, that he makes is, behold, I make all things, I make all things, I make all things. He makes them new not to get old, but to remain new. So when you start hitting those numbers, if you will, starting at an adolescence, a baby, if you will, and then growing into the adolescent stage and teenage years and things like that, you don't even have to be caught up into that mess because every step of the way, you're expected to live holy and according to the new created life that you have in Christ Jesus, that life is in you. What do you do about all of the things that go on around you? What do you do about friends and things like that? You choose friends wisely. You choose as friends, companions, ones that you communicate with. You choose them based on do they walk with God or do they walk with the devil? Because you can't. It's either one or the other. There is no in between. There is no I do my own thing. I do my own thing is under the power of the devil, so you're actually on the devil's side. I do God thing, I'm on God's side. Amen? And I'm complete and I am whole in him. I need not look for anything else because everything is already supplied and it's all sufficient for me. You should say me too. 
Hallelujah. So when the writer started talking about, and when God brought that up in my spirit, I had to go look it up real quick to get the address. It's Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16. And it's like, okay, big deal. I don't think you would say big deal, but it's like, okay, what does that have to do with me? You ever heard motivational words about, you know, how do you see yourself? You have to start visualizing yourself. See yourself as successful. See yourself as commanding attention. See yourself as professional. See yourself as such and such a way. And then do it. And so you start comparing, measuring, and trying to measure up to standards that are set by some who believe that they are successful. I think I just saw something the other day. Um, yes, I, I did. It was a magazine from one of the realtors that we've dealt with in the past, and on the back of it was how to be successful. And if I tell you there's steps, you may be really interested in it. If I tell you God's steps, it may not move you too much. And that's a sad thing because you're a new creation. And if there's anything about your life that you want for you, it should be everything that God has in store for you. We'll sing the song, but do we really mean it in our hearts? Because if we mean it in our hearts, then that's what we're going to live out, work out, and walk out for the glory of God. Amen? And so, anyways, as I'm, I'm looking at this, I see those steps, and it's like, uh, da, 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 da. and it's like, well, what does God say? He tells Joshua, you can keep that up. I'll come back to it in just a sec. He tells him, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, uh, meaning you shall, not, you shall not cease in speaking it. Uh, you shall meditate in it day and night, observe to do what is taught. Actually, he talks about the book itself, this book. And he tells them, for then you will make your way prosperous or successful. Then you will have good success. Can you get me Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, please? We will come back to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 16. It's 8.16 right now. Fancy that. Hallelujah. Thank God for uh, Sister Diana and Sister Shawnee. Stay back there and look at Sister Gabby. She's over there running the camera. And they got the camera all over the place. It was over there at first. I think it was over there at one time. And I'm like, what is that? With the little three things, prongs sticking up. Okay, listen to this. <clears throat> this. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, meaning you shall never cease in speaking it. Say, I must speak the word of God over my life, over my situation, over my family, over my present, over my past, and over my future. It shall not cease or depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. Sounds like a heavy duty assignment that's just too much for me to bear. I cannot do it. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, everybody would focus on the good success, but it's what God prescribes in order to get to that place. Because for some, 
it, it's a very difficult task, even though we're saved, born again, filled with the Spirit, praying in other tongues as the Spirit of God gives the utterance, shouts when it's time to shout, sings when it's time to sing, dance when, you know, they feel like dancing. Um, but then when it comes to actual practicality of what God is saying that will get us to the place of good success, that's when we have a tendency to, well, we got too many other things to do, or we have little or no time to do it. But what is the end, I hate to say end game, but what is the end game of this thing? What is it that we really, really want? We have to ask ourselves, what do I really want in life? God shows me a way that I can be prosperous and that I can have good success. Good success at what? Good success at life. At living for his glory. Next verse, please. Then God comes back to Joshua. Mind you, Joshua is mourning because of the death of Moses. And God is like, Moses ain't here no more. Moses is dead. His life is ended on earth. That's what God means. You, therefore, must arise. Because I have called you to do something great. This is what he says in the previous verses. And now God says, have I not commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. What can we extract from that for ourselves? Well, you know, I'm just weak and nobody, you know, respects me in, in this and that and the other. It don't matter who respects you or does not respect you. Because you're not in the business of pleasing people. You're in the kingdom to please God. You love people. Yes. We are commanded to love one another as we love ourselves. You love people, but you're not here to please people. You're here to please God. So even in a state of a man mourning his spiritual father, if you will, that he's no longer around, but he's been chosen to lead the next generation. He's not only been chosen, but God has bore witness that he's the next one. He is what you would call, some would call anyways, the heir to succession over the ministry that Moses had established being led by God. And now he's saying to him, have I not commanded? I wasn't just suggesting to you, Joshua. I'm not asking or begging you to do this. You must do this. And we see how serious it was just by looking at the scripture there that God would have to, like, Minister Killings, can I use you just for a minute? Uh, you don't mind me messing up your shirt, do you? It's like, it's like God's like, have I not commanded you? You know, not to be rude, but it's like he's trying to get us attention because mind and heart is over there where Moses is buried. My leader is not here. What am I going to do? And God is speaking to him. I command you to be strong and very courageous. Why? Because you're going up against an enemy that's greater than you. <laughs> Praise God. But because I'm with you, they're going to be defeated. But you can't be acting like no coward before them. You got to be strong and you got to be courageous. Your spirit man has to be up and not down in the dumps, nor grieving over something you cannot change. Moses' state has been finalized. Now it's your time. Rise, which is what he tells him. Arise. Okay, thank you, Minister Killings. I didn't do too much damage to his shirt. Be of good courage. Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest, because the enemy is fierce and wreaking havoc on so many people's lives. 
but let it not be so with you. Next verse. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, he starts to pass through the host and command the people, saying, prepare your victuals, for within three days, who knows what three days represents? Anybody, everybody, somebody. Who knows what the number three represents? Samuel Arthur Patton. The what, the what, the what? <laughs> Praise God. That's good. That's a real good way. Did Sister Lauren whisper that in your ear? Okay, good. That's a real good one. Resurrection. Three days. Resurrection. Resurrection power. What did Jesus say? I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be given over to the chief priests and the Pharisees, Sadducees, and all the others, and then also to the <clears throat> Gentiles. <clears throat> I'm going to suffer. They're going to crucify me. I'll be buried for three days, but on the third day, I'm going to rise. So third day means resurrection or resurrection power. It represents that, if you will. When you hit a number three, three also means uh, Trinity. It can mean uh, completeness, if you will. It can mean perfection. But when you talk about three days, that, that should take you immediately to resurrection. Amen? In three days, you'll pass over to Jordan to go in and do what? Go and do what? Go and do what? Go and do what? Go and do what? So what was Jesus' commandment to the disciples? Come on, give me the Great Commission. Anybody, everybody, somebody. I'm going to let you go home in just a minute. Go and preach the gospel. And at the end, he says, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth or the age. Excuse me. So knitting this together, when it says the power of an endless life, as I said, one commentator says it refers to resurrection, that that resurrected life has the power of an endless life. Every one of us have been raised in newness of life, according to what Paul says in the book of Romans, I believe it's chapter 5. Every one of us who put our hope, our faith, our trust in Jesus have been raised into newness of life. Our Savior has already told us that we shall never die because he's referring to this resurrection power. Unless a grain of wheat or a kernel or a seed falls into the earth and dies, it abides alone. If it, if it dies, it'll yield fruit. But if it's not buried, it'll remain and it won't reach its potential because it cannot be released until it dies. And it has to be buried in order to do so. Christ referring to himself. So now he has risen, and he is known as the firstborn of all creation. I used to listen to Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland them, and they would talk about Jesus had to be born again, and I would figuratively throw up when I heard it. Because in my understanding at that time, I got two more minutes, and that understanding, my understanding at that time, we needed to be born again, not Jesus. We were sinful, not Jesus. But what they were referring to is that Christ had to die and then to be born from the dead, never to die no more. His burial 
his crucifixion was a very serious thing that took place. And we realize that when he gave up the ghost, he didn't just go and, you know, travel through space, if you will, soul travel or something like that. He went down into the corridors of hell and took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave from the devil. So we hear about how people would say, you know, of course, of course Satan thought he had him. And they were doing this and that until the third day when he rose from the dead. As soon as Jesus gave up the ghost, Satan was in trouble. He knew he had messed up. What he was trying to do was stop the last plan of God for the redemption of man. But he failed. And Jesus' spirit went down and conquered death, hell, and the grave. And then he came back to life in his body on the third day. And so all hell was then paraded around, if you will. Paul talks about it in the book of Colossians. And he made an open spectacle of them triumphing over it or over them in it, which refers to the cross. It, it, it's like, you know, in basketball, uh, Minister Killings, you probably know the move when they do one of these. You know, something like that when they're dripped. Crossover, yes, crossover. It was like a crossover on the enemy. And he faked the mess out of him. He thought he had him because he witnessed him being crucified on the cross, but he did not understand what was going to happen after he yielded up the ghost. Jesus says, no man take my life. I lay it down, and if I lay it down, I take it back up again. So he possesses the power of an endless life. The grave couldn't hold him. It had no grip on him because there was no sin in him. Though he who knew no sin became sin uh, for us that we might become the righteousness of God. It was a free gift that God was giving us through what Jesus went through. But the power of this endless life now resides in us. So you don't have to be worried about death. Tell your neighbor you don't have to be worried about death. And you don't have to talk about death like it's a sore subject and stuff like that and make people feel kind of like, you know, wow, grieved and stuff. But we don't have to be afraid of death any longer. Death is going to be the final enemy, meaning he's going to be dealt the last blow, death itself. But we've already conquered death because we are in Christ Jesus. So we don't have to fear anything or anyone. We have the power of an endless life. We have it now. We are a new creation, not when we die and go to heaven. We're a new creation right now. It's a creation that sin has no power over. It's a creation that temptations no longer control us. It's a creation that the lust that is in this world, Peter says it like this, we haven't escaped the corruption that is in this world through lust. We've escaped. Everybody say escaped. We've gotten away from it. We've been broken free from it, and it cannot come against us anymore. Well, you get tempted and stuff like that. That's only because you don't know who you are. When you know who you are and you walk in that, nothing has authority over you save Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Ghost. Other than that, you are over all things because you have the power of an endless life. You are a new creation now, and you will be a new creation for all eternity. You are of a different order because Jesus was of a different order. That's why your life is supposed to be different. When I say it's supposed to be, it's not pressure to turn and make it that way. It's just being who you are. It's who you are. 
Will you let that come forth or will you suppress it and hold it back and allow people to just trample all over you? Allow situations and circumstances to trample all over you. Allow the opinions that others have of you. You know, you just let that just put you all in bondage. It doesn't matter what people think about you. About you being different. About you being holy. About you being righteous. It doesn't matter what they, to them, it's of no value to them. But to you, it's life. It's Zoe. So this new life that we have in us, it allows us to. The writer in Hebrews says it like this. I believe it's in chapter 4. So we see that they, cannot, they could not enter into God's rest that he had for them because of their unbelief. Faith is important. They couldn't enter in because of their unbelief. The Bible teaches us that for 40 long years, God was angry and upset with the people. Why? Because they kept wanting to go back to what he was delivering them from. He was trying to take them to a place where they didn't have to labor. Everything was ready for them. They would just have to go in there and little by little, they would drive out the enemy. God didn't want to do it all at once because they would have been overpowered by the animals, the beasts and all, and it would have been too much for them. But little by little, he took them into one city, one nation after the other and gave them victory, gave them territory for themselves. And because they didn't want to do things God's way, they continued to be brought in bondage. They continue to be brought into slavery, if you will. So, we are of a new order. We are a new creation. And we have entered into Jesus' rest. And this rest is a rest to cease from all of our labors of trying to be righteous with God and just receiving the righteousness that Jesus gives us. And again, it's the power of an endless life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It may not do much for you, but it does an awful lot for me because it stirs my spirit and my soul. And when you're dealing with people and you're out there doing what you do, you can have a tendency to uh, either want to be like them or be pressured to be like them. And for many, they just said, forget it. And they just went back to what they were before. And you look at all of their lives, and you can see the wear and the tear. You can see the, the, they age real badly because they've gotten out from underneath the umbrella of God's protection, covering, and covenant. And they become victims of the winds and the elements. And they still don't have the sense to turn around and come back home. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. Don't envy those that are out there doing wicked, ungodly things. And it appears that they're getting, way, getting away with it, getting by with it. And God's not saying anything or doing anything. What he's doing is being merciful to them. And his hope is that they would turn before it's too late. Amen? So be glad that you're righteous. Be glad that you're holy. Be glad that you got a good relationship with God. Be glad that you have an understanding of the word. Be glad and rejoice that you have the power of an endless life in you. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost ruling and reigning big on the inside of you. Amen. I, I, I won't keep you any longer. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Father, we thank you for all the, the offerings that have come in. We, we bless them now in Jesus' name. We thank you for your sons and daughters who are here with us tonight for coming out for the glory of God. Stretch forth your hands in faith. Bless the offerings. 
multiplied the seed sown. Those who are online and giving and participating, bless them as well. Those who give by text giving or online giving, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for moving on their hearts to give and to sow seed, to honor you with their tithes and offerings and gifts of love, many in various ways in order for them to be blessed and be empowered to be a blessing to others. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive, and we thank you for that, Lord God. We pray over the offering. And we pray over your sons and daughters that the Lord our God bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance on you, and grant you his peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing lacking. In Jesus' name, everybody who agrees, say amen. amen. All right, we love you dearly. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you.